Professor Adler? Thanks very much, Will. Um, yeah, so I feel a little bit like Rip Van Winkle. Uh, I stopped sort of writing about uh, uh, a constitutional theory and jurisprudence in 2009, and since then, not because of the Great Recession, but just because my interest uh, uh, moved over to welfareism. Uh, but I'm really appreciative of Mike's invitation to come here uh, and think about this stuff again. I'm obviously gratified that uh, great young scholars like Will are engaging these issues. Um, so let me say that um, uh, I think it's, you know, at the end of the day, the most important question, or A, one of the most important questions to decide whether originalism is the law, that question is going to be contentious. Indeed, it's going to be doubly contentious because conceptions of law themselves are contentious, right? I mean, so there are four different ways uh, uh, if you, you know, look at the jurisprudence literature, and I don't think things have changed radically since 2009, uh, in which the nature of law itself is contentious, right? One is, you know, the well-known uh, uh, difference between sort of a natural law approach and positivism. Natural law approach says law is necessarily moralized, right? We necessarily have to look to moral considerations to figure out what the law is, as opposed to the claim that law is not necessarily moralized, right? Now, within that positivist space, we have inclusive positivism, so Hart, who says that law is contingently moralized, right? The rule of recognition might incorporate moral considerations, uh, and then we have Raz and Shapiro who say that necessarily law is not moralized, right? That the function of law uh, uh, can't be attained if we have to sort of identify its content with reference to moral considerations. So one dimension, again, is the role of moral considerations in the law, which is actually complex. Um, a second dimension of, of contestation about law is, uh, you know, what might be called the recognitional community, right? So everyone agrees, including Dworkin, right, sort of, the, you know, the classic, um, at least modern natural lawyer, that law is not just morality, but it's also based on practices, right? Law is some function uh, of, of, of practices, right? But whose practices, right? This is the second dimension of contestation. So Hart, in the concept of law, right, says it's officials, all officials, right? Hart is very clear that it's officials' practices that constitute law, not citizens' practices. Um, uh, in the postscript of the concept of law, uh, he says it's judges, right? Um, uh, Raz clearly says that law is a practice not of officials in general, but of judges, right? Uh, it's possible to think that law is some function of citizen practices. I actually think Dworkin is best interpreted as saying this. So this is a second sort of cross-cutting dimension of contestation. A third dimension of contestation is, you know, the temporal location of the relevant practices, right? So Hart is very clear that it's current official practices, right? We look to what officials do now to figure out what the law is. Uh, but, you know, those practices could be intertemporal. So I think if you look, for example, at Shapiro's uh, book on legality, he thinks of intertemporal practices as being the foundation for law. He's a planning model where plans are sort of, you know, uh, enacted and then developed over time, and there's no particular priority to present practices uh, in figuring out what law is. The final sort of dimension is sort of foundationalism versus coherentism. So Hart is a foundationalist uh, account of law, right? There is a sort of ultimate rule of recognition, a foundational practice, and the rest of law is valid by derivation from that. I mean, Dworkin's picture, if you look at it, is coherentist, right? Dworkin says there's a whole jumble of what he calls pre-interpretive practices, right, which might be sort of basic foundational understandings, but also views of particular cases, and you put all that together, and then you add morality. All right, so given all this, I mean, it's not like there's kind of an off-the-shelf sort of consensus picture of what law is, and then we can decide, you know, whether originalism or some other interpretive method methodology is law with reference to that. Uh, rather, law itself is contentious for, I think, good sort of meditative financial reasons, uh, um, and therefore the claim that some interpretive method is the law will be doubly contentious, namely one in having to identify a contested conception of what law is, and then, 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 then two to apply that. Just recognize that. I mean, I think, you know, this inquiry is very important, but there's a lot of controversy here. So I, I read this paper as basically using uh, Hart's rule of recognition model. As I said, Hart says the rule of recognition um, is a foundational rule among current officials. Uh, uh, and I see Will as trying to argue that originalism, given this account of what law is, and again, the account is positivist because the rule of recognition itself is not identified with reference to moral considerations, right? Hart says the rule can incorporate moral considerations, but what the rule is is not itself a moral question, right? Um, uh, and I, I see uh, the paper, I mean, Will, uh, 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 you know, talks about current practices. He has this nice notion of an interregnum, right, which is to say that it might well be the case that, for example, at a certain point in time, current practices are originalist, then they may change. But if our current practices are now originalist, right, the law is now originalist, right? So let, let me think about the claims within this uh, Hardian model. Now, in a Hardian model, there are two ways, again, the model is foundationalist, right? There are two ways to show that some legal proposition is true or some norm is the law. One is to say the norm is just in the rule of recognition, right? So Hart's example is, you know, uh, in the concept of law is, of the rule of recognition is what, you know, what, what, what the Queen in Parliament enacts is law, right? That proposition is true just by being in the rule of recognition, 
Now, of course, lots of other propositions will be true by derivation from the rule of recognition, right? So the content of statutes will be true not because a particular statute is in the rule of recognition, but because it's derived from the foundation of rule of recognition, right? So there are two ways, at least in principle, to show that originalism is our law, either by being directly in the rule of recognition or by derivation from the rule of recognition. Um, so I, I take will to be uh, adopting the first strategy. The second, there are lots of ways to do the second, but I, I take it to be claiming that originalism is part of our, our rule of recognition. Now, let's recognize the ways in which that's both easy and hard. So it's easy in the sense that, again, on the Hardian view, you have to look to official practice, right? So the fact that some citizens might have some other view is not really relevant. The question is whether officials in general uh, um, uh, are, uh, you know, uh, originalists in some sense. Um, and in particular, you might look at judges, right? Because if there's a judicial consensus, that strongly suggests that officials are going to have the consensus. Obviously, if there's not a judicial consensus, then there's not going to be an official consensus. Um, uh, so it's current officials. Uh, but what's the sense in which it's hard? The rule of recognition itself is constituted by consensus, right? If there's not official consensus on the rule or some proposition, then that proposition is not in the rule of recognition, right? So the fact that a substantial, I mean, you could have a, you know, a small outlier, but the fact that a substantial proportion of officials don't accept some proposition means, just given Hart's conception, that that proposition is not in the rule of recognition. What you can't do, ironically, you might think that, well, wait, the, the way to defend what seems to be a positive account of interpretation, namely originalism, is by a positive account of law. But note that you can't sort of clean up the rule of recognition by injecting moral considerations, right? You can't say, well, officials are sort of split as to whether originalism is, is part of the rule of recognition, but morally they're good arguments, and so we're going to interpret, you, you know, you can't do the, the Dworkinian move of taking kind of fractured official understandings and saying, you know, we're going to morally interpret those and say that originalism is really the best rule of recognition. You have to show just as a matter of practice, just as a matter of official consensus, that originalism is part of the rule of recognition, right? So in that sense, the burden is hard. So is originalism indeed part of the rule of recognition? I don't have a lot of time, but let me, let me focus on that part of Will's paper as opposed to uh, the second part, you know, which suggests that if it is, uh, uh, there's a kind of legal obligation, a moral obligation uh, for judges to be originalist. So here we should distinguish, and I, I think Will does this, Will talks about first order and second order practices, um, so I'm going I'm to sharpen that a little bit, uh, between sort of first order originalism and second order originalism, right? So first order originalism is, you know, deciding a case with reference to original meaning. Now that itself might be divided into two ways. You might say, you know, how would the case have been decided given the original meaning of, 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 of the provision at issue at the time of the framing? Or how would the, the case have been decided, given original meeting, sort of taking account of the change in circumstances, right? So there, there's first order straight originalism, old timey originalism, right? And first order sort of translated originalism. Now, let me suggest that it is not, even now, in this originalist age, it's not a sort of consensus, you know, official practice uh, to decide cases, judicial practice to decide cases via first order originalism. I mean, I, you know, just look at, and I don't, I think it would be, you know, hazardous to say that Justice Stevens is an outlier, but if you look at Stevens' opinion, for example, McDonald, I mean, what he says as a first order matter is not originalist at all. It's not even originalist in the sense of giving priority to original meaning. So he says, you know, the basic inquiry, he says this is a substantive process case, the basic inquiry, right, is whether the alleged unlawful practice violates values implicit in the order, concept of order liberty, right? And he says liberty is universal. It's not local in particular, right? Whether conceptualized as a rational continuum of legal precepts or as a seamless web of moral commitments, the rights embraced by the liberty clause transcend the local in particular, right? And he says uh, Cardozo's test, right, and undeniably requires judges to apply their own reason judgment, right? But that does not mean it involves an exercise in abstract philosophy, right? In addition, we should look to historical and empirical data, textual commitments, judicial precedents, English common law, legislative and social facts, scientific professional developments, and the traditions and contexts of our people. I mean, that is not originalism. It's not even originalism in the sense of saying we're going to start with the framers' understanding of liberty and then go from there. It is, you know, a kind of common law constitutionalism which does not give particular priority to what the framers thought liberty was. So if the strategy of saying the rule of recognition is, is originalist is going to work, I think it's got to be a defense of second order originalism as opposed to first order, right? Second order originalism says that the basis for the interpretive methods, whatever they might be, so deciding cases with reference to original understanding or precedent, precedent and tradition and so forth, although judges might do that, at the end of the day, they back up their decision to do that with reference to framers intent, right? That is to say, to the extent they're not originalist in deciding cases, it's because the framers uh, uh, meant them to do so. So are judges second order originalists? Or is there a judicial consensus on second order originalism? And I think that's you know, a really interesting question. I actually tried to sort of start researching that uh, in this chapter uh, in my uh, co-edited book on the rule of recognition of the Constitution. I, I looked at how judges and officials uh, and scholars sort of justify interpretive methods. It's possible that although you know, 
at the first order level, they use various methods. At the second order level, they're always saying, well, the reason for this method is because of framers' intent. So well, let me just say, so given only 13 seconds, it's an empirical question. Right? It's an, empirical, it, it's an empirical question. The nature of the rule of recognition inquiry is that it's an empirical question. It's an empirical question how judges and officials make the, the, these interpretive arguments. My conclusion in that chapter is that at the second order level, as at the first little order level, judges are pluralists. So judges justify interpretive methods by pointing to framers intent, but also by pointing to precedent, history and tradition, and to straight moral arguments. If, again, if you look at it, so I would say to look not only at the way Stevens decides uh, uh, the case in McDonald, but how, to, to how he justifies his common law constitutionalism. What he says is a narrowly historical approach would, one, be unfaithful to the expansive principle Americans laid down when they ratified the, the Constitution, but he also said it would, you know, countenance injustices. So, so at, at, at the level of justifying interpretive methods, Stevens points both to original intent and to sort of straight moral argument as well as tradition, right? So the higher order practices as well as the first order practices are pluralist. They're not only pluralist, they're thinly justified. It's sort of a toss-up. He doesn't do lots of, he does much more research in Heller as to the first order content of the Second Amendment as to, as compared to this sort of second order claim that the framers anticipated sort of a common law constitutionalism. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna stop there, but I, I think it's plausible that, um, I, I think it's important to look at these sort of second order judicial practices of justifying interpretive methods uh, no one's yet done the investigation. In a way, Will's uh, paper is a prolegomenon to that investigation. My initial conclusion is that these second order practices are, are themselves quite pluralistic and messy and, and can't sort of be claimed to, get, to, to, to make the use of original intent as a way to justify interpretive methods sort of the main approach. Thank you. Uh, Will? Two minutes? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I appreciate all those comments uh, and just a couple of thoughts. So. One quickly on the jurisprudence. I think it's it's basically right that I'm sort of using some like harsh assumptions about all the various contested jurisprudential questions. Partly because lawyers love heart. Uh, partly because I, I think that's actually sort of helpful to thinking about a lot of the different ways of thinking thinking about what law is. So as Matt mentioned, sort of under a lot of different versions of of what is law, current social practices are an important ingredient. So I hope that sort of doing this is, is helpful to each of those, although I would love to see somebody write a natural law critique or account of whether the same thing is true and, and so on. Um, to some extent, I hope I'm making it kind of hard for myself. I guess I think it's easier to tell a story. If you think that law is based on practices over time, if you think that law has, uh, if you believe in natural law, I think it's actually easier to tell a, a originalism as the law story. and current social practices are often taken to be the hardest case, or like, of course, originalism is not the law in that sense. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, I just thought I would dive into the, to the deep end. Um, on the spirit of prolegomenon, uh, I think a couple of things I, I'm assuming in the paper, and they may be wrong. Uh, one is that dissents don't have the same, not, dissents are more complicated than majority opinions. So the sort of main data set I'm, I'm looking at when I talk about how the court reasons are the kinds of the way the the court actually ultimately rules when it you know when it rules the majority opinion? Uh, you might expect, you might hope that dissents are also sort of part of the practice of law because judges are are going to you know be playing the game and making arguments within the legal system. But for reasons actually that that I think Matt has pointed out in his work, that there's reason to doubt that that's always true. And sometimes it seems like what the dissenters are really doing is proposing a substitute legal rule, and that's, that seems more complicated to me, although maybe, maybe the data set of dissents is, is important too. Um, one last thing. Uh, so on sort of which, uh, you know, is it an empirical question? I totally agree, and that's why I think the sort of prolegomenon is a fair uh, accusation to this paper. But I'll just n note a difference. So uh, one of my colleagues, Eric Posner, wrote a book with Adrian Vermeule on executive power. Uh, he's written several, but, but the, one of the first ones is called Terror in the Balance, and it's about why the executive branch should have a ton of power in national security cases. And Gary Lawson wrote a book review uh, saying basically, I love this book, everything about it is right. The only problem is they don't also note that the original meaning of the Constitution supports their view. Uh, and here's you know, why their, their view is correct as a matter of originalism too. And they wrote, write a response saying, no thank you. Uh, <laughs> we, we are aware that there is an originalist case in support of our view. We are not relying on it. We're not interested in it. We don't claim any support from it. We don't want to be falsified by it if the research goes the other way. Uh, we, we abjure sort of connection to the original meaning. It seems to me that never, ever, ever happens in American constitutional law. 
And that seems important to me in some, in some key way.